on this panel we have a, uh, an amazing cast of, of, of artists, of creators, of culture makers, uh, and we're going to do the same, same sort of format. We'll have some conversation up here, but jump in. Like, we're, it's like, you can even come closer. We can get to a point where like, we're all sitting on the stage together and just having a conversation. Let's do that. Just come on the stage. I've got seats here. Uh, you know, we're, as long as we sort of stay in the camera shot right here, so for posterity, then I think we're all good. John said he's going to crowd surf if everybody got up here. So. John said he's going to crowd surf. So you have your individual mics too, so yes. Okay. So right here uh, to my left uh, is... Hi. Hi, Erica. Hi. Erica Hanna. Yes. Yes. Uh, you, you have won Emmys, Erica. I have. You have won... How many Emmys have you won? Six. So many that she's lost count, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah. You also have a company called, uh, and I'm going to say this like five times because it's fun to say, Puke Rainbows? Puke Rainbows. Puke Rainbows. Yeah. How do you properly say Puke Rainbows? Uh, however you feel you want to express it. Awesome. Yeah. How do you, because I'll never do this story justice, why is your company called Puke Rainbows and what does it do? Oh my goodness. Okay, so that's a story. Yeah. If you want the story. Tell us the story. Okay, so I'll try to make it quick. Puke Rainbows came about because uh, when I first started on Twitter, I was that super annoying person that posted positive quotes all the time and that's like all I did and you're like, oh my gosh, shut up, you know? And But this kid from Brooklyn uh, said, I really love your positive quotes and I don't have a great home life and it helps me, you know, and, and you're kind of like a mentor for me in arts. And I was like, okay, cool. And he said, but I don't understand most of them because they go over my head. So what do they mean? And I said, well, they basically mean, and I'm sorry, I'm going to drop a, a swear word. So earmuffs if you need it. Um, it basically means when life gives you rain, puke a fucking rainbow. And he was like, Oh, I get what that means. And so he would do hashtag puke rainbows whenever he was doing something, like when he got into art school, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, my accountant was like, hey, it's time to name your business because you're making enough for freelance. So what do you want to do? And I was like, puke rainbows. And she's like, nobody will ever do business with a company named puke rainbows. And I was like, then they hate fun. And I do not want to do business with those people. And then you won six Emmys and showed them all. <laughs> Sitting next to Erica is Wale Agbula, uh, who is a photographer and cinematographer and the creative force behind Dean and is invariably the best dressed man in any room that he goes into. He has to go to a meeting after this. He has to go to a meeting after this. Don't, don't be fooled. He always looks this good, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Wale doesn't use mics either, so we're going to have to all channel his conversation. <laughs> use a mic. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, tell us about Dean. What, what is it? What do you do with it? Dean is a small production company. Cl closer, closer to your mouth. Yeah. There you Dean go. is a small production company I started when I was 19. Uh, it's named after my grandfather, um, who passed away when I was four. Uh, he was a very revered man. My father talked about him like he was God. And it's kind of my Martin Luther King. When I was growing up, I would learn a lot about him and I would learn a lot about my father. Uh, it's also my middle name. Mm. Uh, we do a lot of work with companies around Minneapolis and also international company. So Puma, 3M, General Mills. And uh, I was one of the creative force behind uh, What's that? The hamburger helper mixtape? Oh, All yes. Those, the hamburger most, helper mixtape. Most of those little things. Uh, beside that, we just, we do little things to make your company look bad or look good. Yeah. Just, yeah. And you were telling me that you had three coffee meetings before you came this here. Morning, and then you have already. to run after this panel to get to a to noon meeting. One, and then come back again. And yes. And go to the office again. That is a hustle right there. You don't stop hustling. Yeah, right? It keeps going. Well, if I look at my watch, it's not because you're boring me. It's because I want to get you out of here on time. Uh, no, no, no. Don't yeah. do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Pay attention to this. This is quite great. Thank you guys for being here today, by the way, man. You guys look beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next to Wale is John Gebretatios. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you're good at this. You, yeah. Uh, you are... They tell me you're funny. I've been told. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I feel. This is like the fifth or sixth time this morning <laughs> I've been made to be the comedic foil for a panel. I don't, 
I don't know. All right. <laughs> All right, then we'll just be very serious from here on out. Uh, so you founded Black. You're one of the co-founders of Blackout. Blackout. That's Improv. right. Yeah. Blackout, an all-black improv group. Yep. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. There you All go. right. Tell tell the people uh, tell people why that's absolutely critical to have an all-black black, black uh, improv comedy troupe. Okay, get the Kleenex box. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we we started it because we didn't just didn't see uh, people that were represented on stages that looked like us. And uh, we also, um, during the time, we didn't know that there would be so many police shootings uh, and we needed a place to have people that look like us on stage talk about it in a way that resonated with us. So it was twofold. One, we needed to be represented on stage and then after the fact, we realized that it's important to have people that look like you on stage that can talk about things that you can relate to uh on stage so that's blackout and then also i got my start really working with huge theater which does a lot of work in the community to get people interested in improv which once that surface is scratched there's more like work that comes as a result of that but yeah <sighs> <laughs> and then next to john is nora rahimian who is in from los angeles i am so very sorry that we uh brought wintry mix along for you to come it's to okay. minneapolis I'm roughing it today in the yeah. snow it's okay yeah um you do a lot of you wear a lot of different hats you I wear do. many different hats uh you're one of the co-founders of the culture fix hashtag in conversation you are a united nations uh fellow yeah 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 <laughs> i have it written down uh, yes. Uh, yes. uh alliance of civilizations fellow um Tell us about things that you do and what, why you're interested in this conversation around aligning yeah. your values and what you do in life. Um, so I, I run a small record label. We work with African and African diaspora artists as a way of challenging white supremacy. Um, I help artists do social impact work um, and kind of play matchmaker between creatives around the world. And it's the idea that when we connect, we can override visas and bans and walls and all kinds of things because you can send a file, you can post on Inst you know, there's all these ways where we can um, tell our own stories and celebrate our own joy. Um, and these are all acts of resistance. So if I can be a facilitator of resistance in positive ways, let's do it. Awesome. And the label is called International Black. International Black. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean... Where do we want to start? Like, do we want to just like go through, like scroll through the hashtags of the last panel conversation, just read some of that and carry that on? Um, I'm really interested in this question, especially sort of building off of what was being talked about in the last panel around uh, failure and how you work through things and how you find out what you really want to do. Uh, part of the description in this panel is around the benefits that come from when you align yourself with your values. And that description sort of presupposes to me that you know what your values are. So I'm going to ask, and this can be both sort of philosophically, but then if you have like a concrete example of it, how you have discovered your values or how your values have been imparted to you. Uh, I'd love to talk about that for a minute. Um, yeah. Anybody have something? Or I can talk for a minute. Nora, you jump in. <laughs> so um, our in the work that I do and the people that I work with, our politics are just as much as important as the work. So I don't work with people who I don't like, who are hard to work with, and whose politics don't align. So, and it's, it's systematized. So in the contract it says, if we have a dispute, we'll use restorative justice principles. It says if you are sexist, racist, homophobic, that ends our working relationship. Like, these things are, um, it's like part of the infrastructure of how we work, but it's also because I want to make a conscious choice only to work with people whose work is making the world a better place. So, um, and it's meant, you know, giving up like big names because they're sexually trying to harass somebody or whatever. And, and that navigation of, that's probably one of the most challenging things is when it seems like the, out, like the output can be really big. This could be a big contract or a big client and having to say no because their values are not aligned with the kind of space that we're trying to create. Did you come, and this is for International Black. How, yeah. how long, have, how long have you, has International Black been a company? Um, ah, two years on and off, but I consult for artists also. Mm -hmm. So whether it's for the label, it's for my own, sure. it's for cult, whatever, under whichever hat, um, kind of this like unapologetic 
politics is is what I lead with, and it's why people find me. Um, yeah. You know what you're like. You know what you're getting into when you reach out to me. And then that's because you know you're living out what you're believing and putting that out in public and following that up. At what point did you actually systematize that and write that into a contract? Like, because I mean, one has to precede the other. I'm sure you didn't write the contract. I mean, like now I'm going to fight against sexism and homophobia right. and racism. Right. I mean, it's always been me, right? Like, I was a product of war, came to this country as a refugee. So the politics I've always kind of lived. Um, it was when I started getting serious about the business. Um, we were talking about this earlier, like when I started saying, you know, my time is valuable. And so the more I got serious about the business, the more I found ways to create infrastructure around the values. Mm -hmm. um, so they kind of developed together, but it was happening authentically anyway, because if I wasn't feeling you, our relationship wasn't, probably wasn't going to be the best match, like our match wasn't going to be right anyway. Yeah. Someone else want to jump in? Yeah. Sure. <coughs> yeah. Let's say the question one more time. <laughs> it's basically how, how do you know what you know, right? How, how have you defined your values and then put that out into the work that you're doing? Yeah. I think, um, well, people who do improv kind of know well, we do the work that is based off of what we have as a human on mm -hmm. stage. We don't have a script or a director. So a lot of it, and uh, credit to Jill and Butch and a lot of people that kind of found it huge, that there's an underlying philosophy that you kind of bring who you are and that's enough. So that is already just kind of like instilled in us as performers. So then off stage, you go into the world and you're like, well, no, I don't believe that. And it kind of like, similar to you, just kind of uh, one works with the other at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know, I never intended to be like, I got values <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm go on stage and do these jokes, but I got values. <laughs> it, it just kind of happened as a result of going on stage and being like, oh yeah, I, I'm enough as I am. Mm -hmm. So people should have the same rights that I believe I should have. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't grow up in America, right? I grew up with a, uh, in a very, very emotional family. My grandpa and my father, I grew up with such values that, you know, if you did something wrong, you have to deal with the consequences. Mm -hmm. You don't get away with it. So my work value and my work ethics surrounds that because I didn't go to school for photography. So either way, I had to work ridiculously extra hard to be where I am. Mm -hmm. And it's also just about kind of highs, having the highs to see what you want to kind of present to people. I went to school for aviation. And I flew planes. I didn't. You, you look like a high class pilot. <laughs> Stop. Uh, so, my core value is that, you know, if I'm working with a client and they don't Sorry, take that's the point. Over two for Carl? Over <laughs> two for Carl. <laughs> I got some giggles out there. Okay, cool, cool, yeah. cool. All right, cool. You're good, you're good. So, my core value is that if I'm working with a client who doesn't take the project as serious as I am, then there's no need for us to go forward. And if you're late to meetings, if you're late to things, that means you're not taking it as serious as I am. So my core value is, when you give me a project, be a serious, and if I'm doing something pro bono, be a serious too. Yeah. Also, like, just know time. Time is valuable. We're here for a short amount of time, and I want to accomplish a lot, and I wish you want to accomplish a lot. Mm -hmm. As my grandpa and my dad always say, man, time is money, do your thing right, and be you, and be good to people, and you'll be here. Yeah. So I'd say my core value in uh, Puke Rainbows would be accessibility for video. Uh, I, I just really believe in accessibility in all things, whether it's, um, you know, I grew up in a basically like a welfare family and didn't have access to a lot of things. And um, video can be really expensive, right? So... Uh, one of the ways that Puke Rainbows gives back is by doing these smartphone video workshops on how to use your smartphone to empower your nonprofit or whoever it is to do video as well. And uh, hourly consulting with people that want to do that too. So, um, and I think that the cool part about that is or, or then taking an idea that can be visually stunning but doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money. Uh, you know, we did a music video where we put uh, 50 desk lamps on a rooftop and it looked, it was free because we borrowed desk lamps from all of our friends, you know, and, but it looked great and, and, and 
um, elicited em emotion from the artist. And, and I love that because I love showing people their stories almost in a, in a different way, right? Like it's, it's like if someone comes to me, I want to help inspire you to keep doing what you're doing in a visual way. And that's the best thing for me is if somebody, we get done with their project and they're like, wow, I do awesome shit, don't I? And I'm like, yeah, you do. Keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, sort of like a follow-up question to this because uh, I think to my, like I have a number of different like mantras that I use for myself when I'm thinking about how I am in the world and how I'm being in the world. One of them, I mean, one of them for me is be easy in that same way that, you know, say yes to things is like be easy to work with. Uh, be open to things, be serious, that accessibility. Are there more, are there more things that you tell yourself uh, over time to sort of remind you of your best self as you're working through your life and situations? Go ahead. Work with people who inspires you. Work with people who inspire you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I didn't get like heavily, heavily, heavily serious into working with like people that I just like I sat down with, uh, I think this is back in 2015, right? In summer, before I left for London, I sat down with uh, Chastity Brown. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we spoke for about, like, I just met this stranger, right? And we spoke for about five to six hours. And I left that conversation. She gave me a book to take to London with me. And I remember sitting on the plane for hours, just thinking about that conversation and realizing that these are the people I kind of want to surround myself with. So work with people that inspires you, and your work with is so flawless. And she does that, and every time we work together, I, I still just like recall living in those moments like, who are you? Did you do the Song of Sirens photography? Say again? Did you do this photography for her last record? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we have a street project coming out soon. Nice. Stay tuned, <laughs> Giant Steps. So great. Um, so I think that's important, and especially surrounding yourself with people who you can work with, who support you, who like that, that tribe is everything. And for me, one of the things is like, I'm all, I'm all about relationships and I might not know what we could do together today, but like I met Susan like two years ago on Twitter. And now look at like, you never know where a relationship can lead. And I can trace people that I'm working with today to things that happened to someone like, so really cultivating networks and relationships, not in a way where it's about like, well, what can, what can you do for me today? But who are, like, let's just get to know each other. What can I offer you? And really like, it's like, you, it just has to, has to be nurtured. Um, so that like connection and vibe thing is critical. The other thing for me, I, I struggle with um, imposter syndrome sometimes. Mm, yeah. Like, am I really the person to help you do this? And so in terms of mantras, legit, I channel my inner white man. I do. I, I look at, like, how many mediocre white men are running shit. And, like, I'm actually qualified. And so I really, I'm like, if, like, I channel my inner white man. And I, when it comes to, like, quoting prices and establishing myself as an expert, like, that, that mantra and surrounding yourself with people who will help you channel your inner white man, like, that's everything. That's like been a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. Man, uh, that's great. Um, <laughs> we are gonna adapt that rule at Blackout. <laughs> we will all channel our inner. I'd, I'd love to see that improv. <laughs> yes. <skit. laughs> <laughs> An hour and a half, two intermission. Uh, we. Uh, yes, and to everything yes, that everybody said, I would. Uh, I would. The only thing I would add is um, when we're in that working relationship and bringing what I can bring, the goal, like improv, is how can I make uh, you look good? So if I can make you look good, and if you make me look good, then together we're just, we're, we're, uh, we all look good. But yeah, the, the, yeah, I guess that's, and that, the deeper thing with that is that um, it kind of ties into what you're saying. It's like, how can I be a best service to you is, uh, and I'm just echoing what you just said, but uh, it's really important for improv, and I think it really has helped me off stage, is like looking at how can I work with people in the best way that uh, like highlights what they're bringing. Because time is important, I'm important, everybody's important, but also like we can't deny that we're working together on something. We're not in silos, we're not just 
separate, so if we're going to be in this relationship, what's the best way to make this teamwork look great? Um, so, yeah. I'd say that uh, yes and. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> surrounding yourself with people that believe in you is one thing, but believing them is another thing. Yes. So I did this project after reading a uh, article uh, called How 50 Coffees in a Year Can Change Your Life. And so basically the concept is you have coffee with one person and then you ask that person, who, who do you think I should have coffee with? And it expands your network um, and it's wonderful. And what I didn't expect to happen, because at the time I was working in television and had been for 10 years and just kind of thought that's where I would be forever, um, is that 70% of those people were like, so when are you gonna start your own thing? When are you gonna do your own thing? When are you gonna do your own thing? And I'm like, ha, you're funny, ha, no, ha. No, I could never do that. I, I'm not a business person, I don't understand that. I'm a creative weirdo, I don't get it. And um, it's like, if you are hearing something over and over and over, you owe it to those people to at least check it out and um, to start to believe it and to let your imposter syndrome take a hike, you know? Can I, I mean, this idea of like, I'm not a business person, right? Like we believe these things about ourselves and especially I think for those of us who are creatives, it's this construct that you can't be creative and a business person at the same time or that you can't be focused on social justice and creative at the same time and a business person at the same time. And, you know, I, we run a, a record label. We're not like a traditional record label where we're trying to own your rights and do you dirty. We're trying to overthrow capitalism in the process, but I also still want to get paid my value. So there's ways to like navigate those things. And a lot of it is like, I am this, period. And if, you know, if you speak Spanish, it's like the difference between estoy and soy, like what's permanent and what's impermanent. And so part of that is how we think about ourselves. And I think that's so, so real. Can I add? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> go, John, go. So my friend, Alce Bruno, he left to San Francisco and he was big into social work, uh, big into like uh, kids and, and like making sure that they get the right kind of education, meeting them where they're at. I was not. I was not at all. I was like, we just, we're just going to go on stage. We're just going to do our thing. He's like, no, nah, man, but it's about off stage, too, and the kids. And I was like, okay, fine. Uh, he was like, so we'll start out. He was like, we're going to do blackout education. I was like, what? <laughs> we're, just, we're just trying to do our improv. But he was like, no, 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 no. Um, so he set up all these connections. And then he was like, oh, so I'm moving to San Francisco. I was like, what? <laughs> so, so he left me with like things on the calendar that I was not I was not excited to do to be honest and did not feel like I had any expertise to do any of these things but then when I did it I was like oh yeah there is room for all of it there's that all kind of works together and I don't have to be like I'll say who's like no I'm for kids justice and da 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 and then I do improv I could just do what I do and then as a result we end up uh, making the world better Again, Alcide Bruno, if you want to look him up, <laughs> don't do business with him. He will leave you. <laughs> I love him. I love him. He's great. Yeah. Also, like, uh, knowing your self-worth, yeah. knowing what you're worth, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> it's such an amazing thing. I think uh, you were talking about imposter syndrome, right? I think I remember getting my big first commercial gig, right? And there was about, and mind you, I'm used to like two people on set. And this commercial gig was about like 30 people on set. And I was just like, and they're asking me for what's next. And I'm just like, whoa, this is the big shot. This is the league down. And I remember just going through that day and realizing that this is what you have to do almost every day now, get it right and check. And also, knowing yourself can also become a, kind of an ego trip at times. And also putting yourself in check when stuff like that happened and knowing that you're just a person and you're trying to run a business. But also just be true to yourself and just know yourself and know what you can handle and what you can't handle. And say no if you can't handle something and say yes when you know you can handle something. And ask people for help. People are always willing to help. No one is just gonna say no. 
people are always willing to help. But also be careful of which advices you take from people because advice is a kind of a form of kind of something they've lived through in the past. So make your own decisions and be well with yourself and be confident in yourself because you are worth it, really. So, so yeah, mm -hmm. self-worth, know it. It's good. Yes. Self-worth is huge and it can also be really scary to embrace um, because as we talk about the ripple effects of aligning with your values, it's not always pretty right? It's not always this thing. It's not going to be necessarily this thing where you're like, you know what? Today I'm starting a business that aligns with my values. <laughs> and for me, what it was is I was in a job at a place that I will not name. And my boss called me a few horrible, horrible names and said that I was worthless and um, a lot of different things behind closed doors and um, basically came at me with closed fist and I was like, oh my gosh, she's gonna probably hit me, you know? And it was that moment that I freaked out and was like, what am I doing here? And then I went to my therapist and I said, can you just give me something like, like meds or something to calm me down so I can go back to work? And uh, my therapist actually said, no, I'm not gonna give you any medication to calm me down to go back to work. My prescription for you is that you're gonna quit your job on Monday and I'm gonna help you write a business plan because you're at a toxic place. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I had, $400 in my checking account that day. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I'll try it for a while, I guess. Like, I'll get a business credit card and just put everything on that for a while, you know? So it wasn't pretty. It was ugly and it was horrible and, um, you know, a bit traumatic, to be honest. But um, when he said that, there was this weight that just went like, oh my gosh, I can try it, okay. I'm being forced to try it. So here we go. <laughs> so sometimes those opportunities don't necessarily look like opportunities. It's like they look like a, a disaster. <laughs> so, but run with it. I gotta share. That's why you're here, John. Bruno. Okay, the, the, this is, a, so we're talking, I like this. We're talking about alignment with your values and everything, and this is, it's. That's beautiful because like sometimes you can get a clear cut like direction to go in and you muster all the courage and then you have support with your community. In real time, I'm going to just share because this is public knowledge. At Huge Theater, we did not know unbeknownst to us that our landlord uh, ended up being someone that sponsored um, KKK, right? Just gave a $500 donation to the, 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 somebody that supports. You want to say their name? David Duke. David Duke. All right, uh, so we, we didn't know, like anybody else would not know, like we don't, we didn't know. So then we found out, and this is all public knowledge, uh, and then we released a statement, Butch Roy released a statement that said the, let me try to get it right, the KKK and the Ku Klux, uh, the Nazis and Ku Klux Klan can fuck straight off. That's a public statement. <laughs> it's very clear to let everybody know where your values are, where you align. And then, but now in real time, we as a community are figuring out how we all move forward. So, I mean, it's, it's a process, I guess is what I'm saying. And it's, uh, it's not an over, overnight thing. And I'm sure, like, after getting that prescription, it was a process after that. So, uh, just put a positive spin on this. I'm learning to love the process. <laughs> and, uh, and recognizing that there's no, there's no end result that you can always aim for, but uh, kind of maybe there is. I don't know, but that's real time. That's what's happening right now. Uh, and we're figuring it out, and, it's, and we're very transparent about it. And I think what I've learned about that is that being transparent about your situation um, invites people in to support in ways that they wouldn't have showed up before. And I think that's when uh, that's, that's changed me and made me have a little more hope in humanity. So on one hand, you have this person that's, I'm gonna be all say, he's, he's evil, he's the devil. <laughs> uh, and then on the other hand, you have beautiful people that wanna support and, and how they came together, it blows me away. But being transparent is, is had a lot of people show up and support us as a, as a theater and as art form in ways that we didn't expect. A lot of cool, cool people supporting improv now. 
I mean, I, I think the transparency part is also about vulnerability. And it's so, especially in a world of like social media and things like that, like we just want to see the shine. We like the overnight story. We, we, we don't like to show the pieces where we're struggling or, but it's hard. There's days where you're like, am I going to have a client or, you know, whatever, like all this ugly, difficult pieces of it. And those pieces of the story don't get told. And we can look at that historically where like America is built on manifest destiny and right, the American dream, but there's a, you know, that, that seeps into our work. And so being transparent and vulnerable about like the ugly pieces is really where people are gonna connect with you. Like that, that authenticity, it's not like, oh, these are my values. Like that's easy authenticity, right? Like this is what I want, that's easy authenticity. But the piece where you're like, yo, this shit is hard. I don't believe in myself today. Here's the setback that I had. Like those, that risky authenticity is also where you create the opening where people are going to connect with you and find you and reach out to you. And that, there's like real, real opportunity in that. What I love about this part of the conversation too is that we're talking about both sort of personally, whether it's you know, your individual business or your waking up in the morning and imposter syndrome, but also how that really builds up into the organizations that you're a part of and that you can build systems that don't mirror or recreate monolithic structures or oppressive structures. Uh, if we take that same kind of transparency and vulnerability that we're trying to practice with ourselves into the organizations and into the systems that we're building together. Uh, I know that we're having a good panel when I haven't said anything for like 15 minutes, so I know that I'm doing my job as a moderator relatively well then, but I'm going to switch it over and we're going to open up to Q&A because uh, we want to make sure that Wally gets out of yes. here on time. <laughs> 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 no? Did you just say I no? I mean, <laughs> there's a panel right after us too. It's not just for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to jump in? Jump in. No. No. Okay. Question. Well then, uh, let's 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 keep this weird and rambling conversation out, uh, out into the audience. Uh, are there questions? There's. I see one hand over there. We have a mic coming to you, ma'am. I'll meet you halfway. Um, so, for all of you to make a ripple, you have to move the needle. And I'm guessing that all the people here are trying to move the needle in some way. And in order to do that, you have to teach people what to do and how to do it. And I was just wondering what thoughts you have about how you've had to educate people in order to get them to help you move the needle in whatever that means to you. So how have you taught people what they need to know? Good question. So, I don't do that anymore. Like, I only work with people who get it. And if you don't get it, someone else can work with you. Like, and that's a self-care decision I've had to make. Like, I don't have the time or the energy to convince you and teach you. An ally can come in and, like, do that work. So I don't. But, like, what if I just got a job with you and you hired me? I wouldn't hire <laughs> you. Wouldn't? Okay, cool, cool. I cool. love you. Lots of love. Cool. I wouldn't hire you. Right, good to know. Just wanted to clear that up. I will not be working there, My guys. authentic <laughs> truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I had my joke. There we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think in my, in, my, uh, in my business, I think a lot of people kind of come up and kind of ask you questions like, how did you get to where you are and everything like that? And, and I was just like, you know, instead of going freelancing, accept a full-time job on the side and work on your business as you go because you don't know exactly where the next money is going to come. As a freelancer, that's one of the most scariest things in the world. Yeah. But I worked eight hours shift a day, and I go home, eat dinner for like an hour, and then I go back eight hours on din. That's the way it works. So if you have a passion, follow that passion, but also know like, if you need to take something aside to work, do that. It's your dream, man. Make it happen. Make it anyway. And that's what I kind of did. I worked a lot, and I said a lot of no. I didn't go to drinks, happy hour, no. I went home, and I slept at 3 a.m., and I woke up at 7 a.m. and do it again. And I still do that. That's just the way it works. No one is going to fund your future, by the way. Just letting you know. Mm -hmm. No one is going to give you a check. Hey, go do this. You've got to be very diligent and you've got to be very well with yourself. And it's a mental thing. Um, I've always remembered our, our parents like waking us up at like basically 7 a.m. in the morning. 
And if I sleep past 7 a.m. in the morning, I can still hear my dad's voice. Ah, I'm a e. You're a lazy one. <laughs> you know, you remember those things. And it, it, it's like instinct in you, really, growing up. So, yeah. So, I can't remember where I read this, but um, I use the seven, th seven things principle list for the day which is make a list of seven things you're gonna do. It could even be like sending one email is like one thing, that's enough. Um, and make sure that five of them relate to your dream and that two of them help you practice self-care and uh, keep things rounded. Um, so it literally could be sending five emails in a day. Um, and then the nice thing about that is just being able to reflect and say, because I have this, this you know, it's just like imposter syndrome. I also have this voice that tells me like, you didn't do shit today. What did, what did you do? You waste your whole day. You didn't do anything. You shouldn't be in business for yourself. You're so lazy or whatever that is, you know? And when I have the list, then I'm like, no, there's proof. I did something. Now I can keep going, you know? So that helps me personally, I guess. Yeah. Each one, teach one. I guess it's uh, just a old saying that stuck with me. If in terms of like, with improv and new performers or whatever with blackout. So we have an obligation to kind of make sure that if we leave, that there's people there that can take our place. So I guess from that standpoint, um, it's a lot easier. Then, then the stakes are high, because if you're gone, then who else can step up and take your place? So we all have a responsibility in that regards to make sure we're preparing people to fill the space or take over. Also, be patient with yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah be so. patient with yourself. That it's such a very important thing. And now that we live in such a big social world now where you can go on Instagram, you can go on thing and seeing people do great stuff, they didn't get there overnight. Just, no, be patient with yourself and get there by your own process. And also, don't lose yourself. That's what I try to tell people, man. Don't lose yourself, just be patient. You will get there. It's just a mile of time. This is going to sound really oversimplified, but YouTube things. Like, because, yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. yeah. like, there's so many experts out there giving free advice. Like, if you are stuck, like, type it into YouTube. You know, I did my own website on Squarespace, and I was like, I don't know how to do a website. How do I do it? How do I put a form in there? Oh, YouTube. Like, the you know. The Rainbow's website? Yes. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube for the win. YouTube, Squarespace. Ah. <laughs> question over here. Yes, I have a question for John and a question for Erica. So John, you were talking about how you weren't that excited to do these education gigs in the beginning, but did it work out that that became a new income stream for Blackout? And how did that help? If that was the case, did it help to make your um, organization more sustainable? And for you, tell us a little bit about that first year with $400 in your bank account, what your next step was um, and you know how you started to build your business in that early stage. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up. I don't hate kids. Uh, I love kids. I didn't realize that it was going to be another uh, a revenue stream. Um, and it was also not only just another revenue stream, but another place for other performers that were passionate in it to be able to express themselves and show that they have a strength in that. So. Yeah, and it's, it's opened up many more doors, more connections, and, and, um, and yeah, internally, externally. Um, also, yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right. Is that answer? So my first month, I think I made $57 or something odd like that. Like someone asked me to do a headshot, like one. <laughs> I don't know. And... Um, I really was panicking and I, I just was like, this is a horrible, horrible idea. What are you doing? And um, just kind of then stepped back and said, okay, I need to talk to people in the industry. So I went and I talked to my friends in the industry and they go, oh, you dummy. Like, like January through March is the worst time for production of the year. Don't worry about it. It's not you. It's just the, it's just the nature. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I had just as many coffees 
as possible. And I talked about it all the time on social about what I love to do. Not in a way of like, hey, I'm offering this service and da 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 da, but in ways of like, doing little tutorial videos and here's a how-to of, of doing this and um, when I would get even if it was a pro bono pot project and I still do this I talk I only take clients that I'm super excited to work with because I want to be able to talk about it and that's in my agreement like I'm gonna talk about our freaking project unless it's like completely locked down you know and like there's been a couple of those but I want to be able to talk about it and there is this, oh, I hate this stigma on social media that if you talk about what you love, you're suddenly a self-promoter. Like, oh, you're self-promoter all the time, a self-promoter. Well, what's everybody else talking about? They're just like bitching about politics or, or they're just complaining about something. And that's why you end up standing out because you actually love something. And so it's the perfect time to do it because passion is contagious. So if people can see how much you really love what you're doing, um, then they jump on board and that's what happened. It just kind of slowly from March and then into the summer and then my revenue stream was like, whoa, what's going on and I can't keep up. And, um, and I really do think that part of that is because of the name of the business, vetted shitty people um, and to we were just having so much fun that even if I wasn't talking about it, my crew was talking about it or the client was talking about it. So it's like built-in promotion. First year sucks. <laughs> First just year's terrifying. You know it sucks. <laughs> the question right over here. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm not quite sure how to frame this yet, but I kind of want to pose to the panel a general question about, so you mentioned um, that the mode of your business is trying to, what did you say, overthrow capitalism, right? And then there's also this line of conversation that's happening about revenue streams and building a business and all of these things that I feel like are very much aligned with capitalism. And so I kind of want to know, like, where's everybody sitting in that as people who live in America and have to pay their bills, but also like if your values don't value bills, where do you have this, I'm really in line with my values, let me talk to you about revenue streams. Like maybe Carl can frame it in a question. No, I mean, I think, okay, that, cool. I think that, that, that that's, a, that's, that's a really great question because we're creatives living in late capitalist America uh, where creativity is not necessarily valued in certain ways and where we know that money comes from places that uh, don't align with our values. So how do you negotiate that balance? And I think it's a, something that, you know, working in the nonprofit uh, arts sector, I wrestle with a lot. Where that, yeah. No, right. you're racist. I don't want to write you. Like, the, the, free that. The addendum was, especially if you're not at a place where you can say no to people. Okay, so... Big thoughts on I, capitalism? From a blackout standpoint, I can talk to that. Uh, if, if we take a gig that's a corporate gig, luckily they know like they're going to get black people on stage and we're going to say what we want and we're going to do it the way that we want to do it. So I think... That's our trade-off. If we're going to do this capitalism game, then we're going to do it the way that we know how to do it best. And that's it. And then we walk off stage, and we never walk off stage with any shame, and there's a lot of, a lot of pride in that. And I think that's kind of... It, I don't have a, me a metric system, but I think that would be the, like a metaphor for how we, we are handling it right now. So if we're walking off stage, we're not going to walk off stage with shame, meaning we're going to play this game of capitalism. How do we do it in a way that we're proud and we can look at the work that we did in a way that gives us a sense of like, even hope, even. Hope from the standpoint of like, well, people just pay, like from a blackout point of view, they just gave money to black people to do improv. That got, that's gotta give me a little hope in a little chip at white uh, systemic racism in America, that there's a chip in, the, in this big problem in society. So I'll use, that, to give me a little hope, I don't think it's the answer, but there's some negotiation there internally that I got to do. 
Otherwise, I would just be like, nah, we're only going to do solo shows. You pay at the door, and if you're a white person, you pay an extra. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that's really my question is, like, what is that internal conversation about? Because, like, where, you don't know where that money comes from. But let's just assume that it comes from something that adds to oppression or that, you know what I mean? So, like, yeah, you are getting paid, but the money's coming from Walmart, let's say, or whatever. Like... That kind of, I feel like people can do it, but I just can't see it, and I'm trying to see it, yeah. I, I mean, I think to some degree it's like navigating your own, like what are your hard no's, and what are you willing to take to, like if Walmart gave me money to produce a project, I would produce a project that called Walmart out or that would give people of color a platform that they might not other have, so can I leverage what they're giving, right? So like, are you willing to do that and leverage it? So like imposing people of color into white spaces or whatever. So like, that's one way to think about it. Um, one of the things we do is it's not so much about like, let's amass money, but how do we create systems amongst ourselves that then become a challenge? So if you can't pay me, that's okay. What can we, what kind of service exchange, service exchange can we do? Um, what other value systems can we create? I also have, <laughs> John and I were talking about this earlier, like I scale my pricing. So I have my white man rate and then I have my community rate. Because as a white man, you're gonna make hella more money off of me than a woman of color is. So, you know, there's like different ways to, to think about like the economic aspect of it. At the label, we're looking at developing a cooperative model so that it's not like traditional indentured slave, you know, servitude that traditional labels are. Um, so it's really about like, you have to get creative with the economic aspect, but also knowing like what your own comfort level is, is really important. Will you take a grant from the State Department? Like, what does that look like? And some of those are just personal, personal decisions. And especially in the beginning stages, if you have to think about, is this gonna give you a catapult to where you want to be so today you'll say yes but you'll never have to say yes again you know so it's like it's not just the short term but like long term what does this mean um so it's it's like really creatively strategizing what your economic outlook could look like yep. that, was, that was amazing <laughs> that was like well put because i'm already the black ship in my business in my industry already i mean try to go into any agency and try to spot out a black person it's a pretty easy game, but when I'm doing project locally for people that I love and care for in my community, I know what price range to put that in, or I know if it's gonna be a pro bono job, but even the agency calls me up and say, hey, yo, we need you to do this for free. Come on, your whole job is to make money, and you do have money, so don't, don't even play that game. But I also just know what my quotes are when it comes to stuff like that. So, like you just said, I know the white man price, and then I know my community price, I mean, and if it's something, if it's community based, you know it's got art. It's got something more to it than anything, and you know you're doing something right. And if it's something for big, like, you know, like 3M or something like that, you know, you know they have money, so you know, you charge those prices right. I don't know, it's all about the community right now, I guess. I mean, I've been working around the community a lot lately, and I love everything, and the feedback from people is always great. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. At least you're doing something for your soul, in other way. I feel like where I've fit in is just trying to do as much listening as possible because I'm not as affected by, you know, oppression and white supremacy as others are. And so just trying to sit back and listen and then also trying to educate in that process. A few rainbows, I, I, I don't get a lot of people that are, you know, the Walmarts and the whatever, and, the, and, and it does pretty much self-vet. The times it doesn't self-vet is um, when I'm speaking, when I'm doing a speaking engagement for a bigger organization that's booked me. And usually the conflict there is that they have gotten catering from someone who is a, a big business that I do not align with. And this happened recently and um, it was a video smartphone boot camp that I did and I walked in and 
they had I hadn't even thought to approve you know the catering and it was Chick-fil-a and I was like no way you know and 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 they were like well that's, it's chicken sandwiches so it's a big deal and so I had to take this young white woman t- aside and say it, it it's a really big deal it's a big deal because Puke Rainbow is aligns with the Minnesota Tech Diversity Challenge and we say that we are not going to do business with organizations that discriminate against the LGBTQ community and this company definitely gives money towards discrimination and I don't want to you know be a part of that and they're like well what do we do now it's here and it's like thing is starting in five minutes and I'm like okay well then you can unwrap all the sandwiches so there's not one logo anywhere and I don't want any promotion for that company and it'll and I'm not speaking for you guys again unless we can agree on a caterer that is ethical and aligns with this contract and um you know and then and then having the pushback of like well i know you might not like their business but they're really good customer service and then just pushing back again and saying that is not the point you are missing the point that I am aligned with Minnesota Tech Diversity and these are the values of my business and that is what I'm choosing to do and you cannot compromise that. And so, yeah, I guess that's where I've had to push back a little bit. On that story of standing up for yourself and your values, let's pivot to that last question that, uh, that we were asked. Uh, what do you need from the people in this room? Great question. Yeah, thanks. No, no. Great, great question. Great question. Good questioning. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'll start. I'll buy some time. Yep. Okay, cool. cool I sent cool. it to you in advance, John. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, here's what I need. I need people to go support live theater. Specifically, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yep. yep, get out there, support live theater. Even more importantly, here's what I need more. Uh, Improvathon is coming up. What is that? What's the date to that? <laughs> November 15th and 16th is at Huge Theater. We do 28 straight hours of improv. And you, you have never seen anything like this before in your life. And that's where we do a lot of our fundraising, is uh, right, right there. So, uh, I mean, just Google it, Google it. Support life. This is what I need you to do. I need you to give Huge Theater all your money. All your money. <laughs> That's what I need. That's what I need. Uh, and support Blackout uh, in any way, shape you can. Yeah. Spread the word. That's what I need. Um, sure. Well, I just um, went first, technically, my friend. <laughs> um, so I need music. And artists, so if there's people on your radar who are doing re- any, like globally, good music, producers, videographers, graffiti artists, storytellers, like, I need them. Um, I'm also looking for a mentor, so if you want to take someone under your wing and, you know, nurture, I'm down for that. Oh, man. I... I'm looking in my business model to uh, not have to be on set all the time, I guess. Um, So what I'm doing a lot more of are these smartphone video workshops or any kind of video workshop, really, and also remote consulting. Uh, So that could be for anyone across the world uh, that I do remote consulting and will do an hourly rate to help people brainstorm ideas and and I do uh, call like minimalist consulting where I'll help you kind of finalize your script, send you off and running, look at your finished product, tell you what to change in your edit, that type of thing. So it's a little bit more affordable for people. I want to do a lot more of that. Um, I do have a smartphone video workshop coming up in November. Um, I will tweet out the date for it. And if you guys, as Giant Steps folks, want to come, I will give you a discount code. Discount code. Discount code. If you want to email me at Erica, E-R-I-C-A, at pukerainbows.com and just tell me that you were in this session and I will give you a discount code for that smartphone video workshop so that you can start creating cool shit. 
So, yeah. I think, I mean, everyone here, it's all community-based. I would say support your community. Uh, if you work at an agency, as a producer, as a creative director, hire black creatives, because we are pretty smart, we're good at what we do. Uh, I've seen a lot of projects go by to photographers that are not as great as any other person, but uh, hire black people, go out of your comfort zone, uh, be diligent, support people like Bobby Rogers, who's doing yeah. amazing, great work. Get them into those work because they're walking a life and they're just smart. Uh, also, just take care of yourself, man. It's cold. Like, take care of yourself and uh, support local artists. We're doing great stuff and uh, black artists the most. Uh, we don't get that voice in the agency world. We never get really hired for those work because people get stuck using the same photographers. Go outside of your comfort zone. Hire people that are doing different things. Uh, just, yeah, mm -hmm. that's just it. It's as simple as that. Hire black folks. Yes, one, one last thing, uh, just because it's inspired me to just to the ends of the earth. Um, when I was working with Prince on a video project, I remember him looking at me and looking at my producer and he said to my producer, I thought you said that she did video. And I was like, oh my God, I messed up and he's gonna kick me out and this sucks, so horrible, right? And he looked at me then and he said, never tell anyone that you do video again. Tell them that you create art. And so what I want, what I'm asking for everybody to do is to take that with them. No matter what you do, you create art, no matter if you're a marketer, you're a business person, you are an artist and you do beautiful things that other people cannot do, so do that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, give them a round of applause. Erica, Wally, John, Nora. Thank you for being here. What I want from everybody in the room is to stay in touch because this is a relationship building and a long-term thing uh, coming from Giant Steps to Giant Steps. I met, I met you at, the at Giant Steps like five years ago. Literally. Yeah, I met... Literally. Yeah, I met John last year at Giant Steps. Uh, you never know when these people are going to pop back into your world. So stay in touch, be open, be vulnerable, be transparent. Thanks again to all of you for being here. Uh, stay warm, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>